Go ahead whenever you're ready, Bernadine. All right. Well, again, good morning, everybody, and welcome to day two of our final week of our annual broadband conference, Broadband 2020 Connected We Stand. Welcome to the folks that are joining us here for the first time and welcome back to those who of us who were with us yesterday. We're gonna be, I'm Bernadine Jocelyn with the uh, Blandon Foundation. I'm the Director of Public Policy and Engagement there. And today, oops, sorry, my just, my dog just jumped and undid my computer. Sorry about that, life with dogs in the house. <laughs> so today through the magic of the internet, I'm joining us here in my cabin near Bacchus in Southern Cass County, where we do have just enough internet to participate in an interactive video call like this, for which I'm grateful. I'd like to invite everybody to check in with the chat box uh, to show where you're joining us from today. Um, so we can see, kind of get a sense in the box, what, who's here from where, that would be great. And as we go through the day too, I invite everybody to uh, tweet about our meeting and your conversations. The hashtag we're using is hashtag MN Broadband. And somebody will um, dump that in the chat box there for us from my team. So I wanted to start with a quick overview of the day today. This first hour right now, we're gonna um, launch into an open space uh, experience together. And the theme for our conversations is better broadband in Minnesota, our next steps. We're gonna have two rounds of conversations on topics that we generated together yesterday. We'll have a moment here to pause to see if anybody wants to offer up a new conversation. And then after that at 1045, we're gonna hear uh, from the Digital Ready Communities report back. Three of our communities here in Minnesota have been working across this broadband month with Purdue University's Center for Regional Development and Kuchiching County, Lesur County and Rock County are gonna share with us this morning their outcomes of that work together with Purdue University to become a digitally ready community. We're gonna wrap up at noon today, but then hopefully regather with uh, many of you this afternoon for our closing reception from our uh, month long broadband conference. Regrettably, it's gonna be a virtual reception. You'll have to bring your own BYOB, but there'll be um, some fun, hopefully. So um, we'll have more details about that reception later in the day, of course. So just as we turn now to our opening conversations this morning, I'm gonna share just another word about open space. We talked a little bit about it yesterday. Basically, open space technology, as it's called, is a facilitation tool, kind of a technique, that creates a container to help people talk about what they really want to talk about with the people they really want to talk about it with. That's basically it. Um, it's a, it's a self-generating content, the agenda and the topics come from you guys. That's what we did yesterday morning was to generate that list of conversations for today. We're gonna to share that out that list out here in just a minute. And I'm realizing Mary, I don't have that pulled up on my computer. Is that something you could uh, get ready to share out with us in just a sec? Get ready to share out the list of yeah, topics? Yeah, so we can, yeah. Um, you mean poll everyone right now or just a list of topics? No, I just want people to be able to see. Oh, you have it oh, in the poll. Perfect. I do have yeah, it. In we're the gonna. Poll. We're, yeah. Perfect. Okay, great. So we're gonna show the list, put it up there, and then people are gonna select what conversations they want to be part of. So we're adapting, of course, this technology to a virtual conference, um, and appreciate your grace as we kind of stumble through this because it it's not the same, right, as doing it live and in person. Um, for example, we're gonna be adapting the, the key rule of open space technology is called the law of two feet. And the law of two feet says that if you find yourself in a conversation where you're not learning or you're not contributing, that it's your responsibility to, to use your two feet to find another conversation where you can learn or contribute. So it kind of calls us to our highest level of responsibility. Obviously, virtually, it's hard to walk from one conversation to another, but um, uh, we will, 
uh, invite you if you turn out to be in a conversation you're really not learning or contributing and you want to try another one you can come on back in and mary will help you get in another room she'll go through those um, in just a minute but i wanted to remind everybody that this law of two feet is core to the idea of open space that we bring our fullest selves and try to contribute or learn so um Mary's going to help us uh, get into those rooms. We're going to have two rounds, two conversations of about 25 minutes each. And we've all been in Zoom rooms, so you know how we'll get that notice to help us get out. We will have a chance after the first round to hear from your conversations. So when you do get in your rooms, um, just you want to make sure everybody gets introduced, everybody gets a chance to speak, and agree then who's going to share out at the end up to three key highlights or um, uh, ahas from your conversation. So we'll hear a rep from each topic group at the end of each of our two rounds. And we'll be particularly interested, folks, when you report out, are there any next steps? Are you guys, you know, what did you, is, is there any so what that came out of that brief conversation that you had? Then we'll repeat it and do round two. So as we, um, I'm going to turn it over to Mary here now for to show us the list to get us um, uh, figured out who goes into what rooms. But just please do keep in mind just a couple of agreements as we go into these conversations. Now, introduce yourselves, agree on somebody to report out, be sure everybody gets a chance to speak, make room for all the voices in your room, speak with intention and listen with attention. Okay, Mary. Over to you. Hey, everyone. You probably noticed that Anne pasted the list in the chat box. She's brilliant that way. Um, so we're uh, to get to get us sorted into the rooms, it's going to be a two step process. And in the first step, we're just going to determine who wants to um, which rooms we should open this first time um, for this first round. So um, I am going to put up a poll and give everyone a chance to vote for the room that they most want to be in. And we're gonna hope that, you know, let's see, we have about, we're gonna hope that, you know, there's five, four or five clear winners that we can make breakout rooms for. So I am gonna start the poll. I'm gonna launch that right now. And you'll have a chance to go into another room a little later, but just kind of pick your favorite. And I know if anyone wants to hear about digital navigators, our expert today is only going to be around for the first session. We're going to leave this open for a minute because I know it's 10 choices. It's a lot of words to read through. We're at 13 votes so far. And when you want to vote for six, you have to pick one and that makes it harder. It does make it harder. It's nine o'clock and I've only had one cup of coffee, so it's extra hard. Right. And at this point, if you hadn't made your choice yet, you might just make your choice from the ones that already have a couple of votes. I'm not sure we can see who's got votes. Oh, that's right. I don't, th I don't think I can anyway. I suppose, I suppose that's true. <clears throat> Only I can see that. Um, what? what uh, I, I, I chose, this is Becky, I chose the... Um, the because I'm so interested in the copper um, abandonment, but then I don't know what a digital navigator is. Maybe I should change. I don't even what is a digital navigator. Mark, do you want to take that one? Maybe I should change. <laughs> I better since I I don't even know. I'm supposed it, to be learning. So digital navigator okay. concept is just um, having people who are who intentionally are are trained and positioned to help 
end users uh, navigate the digital world, whether in a school environment where I am, it's talking with parents and families about distance learning, about broadband access, kind of uh, device access, et cetera. Oh, thank you, thank you, Mark. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with um I'm gonna stick with the copper then because I've got all my IT people at Namaji who um they're my brains, you know. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so we're at 23 out of 31 have voted, and it looks like we're should I end this and I'll show you all the results? Because I think sure. we have a few. Um, so it looks like we're at how to remove the barrier of affordability, copper, how do we find the common ground to move the state forward on broadband, what should Minnesota speed goals be, um, broadband as a public or private utility. So that's, so the ones that have three or four votes are one, two, three, four, five. Should we open up five rooms, do you think? We have 34 people. Would it work to, so then will people be able to choose which of those five rooms they wanna go into? Is that how this will yes. work then? Yes. Super. Yeah, why don't we start with those five rooms uh, this round and then we'll come back to this well of topics for round two. And if po folks have a new topic they wanna add at that point, we'll take it then. Okay, and it's gonna take me just a minute to get the room set up. And then everyone, um, there's a there's a new function in Zoom where you can choose your own breakout room. So I hope that works for most of you. Um, and if other people, if you, if for some reason you can't access that, I can um, uh, put you in a room after. If that doesn't work, I'm gonna take a snip of this because just in case I, it loses me when I'm trying to. So this is the part of the coverage where we have um, banter, right? Yes, go ahead and banter, please. <laughs> Witty banter. Where, where in the um, system is, uh, would we look for the breakout room option? Does anyone know? So I think Mary's going to display that here for us okay. in just a minute, kind of like the voting, Eileen, just like just now, and we'll okay. click on it. Okay. It'll pop up in the bottom of your screen. Okay. Here, I thought I was going to find something new in here. And this might take another minute because there aren't very many characters. I have to paraphrase all the breakout room names, so. I'm going to take advantage of uh, Dwayne Nelson being on. I want to ask if there are uh, any signs of the St. Louis County um, doing any of that uh, trimming of brush along your roads in the township. I don't think I've seen anything in Worry Township yet. That's their uh, million dollar investment of their CARES Act dollars for broadband highways, they called it. It should help all greatly. <laughs> and I did speak to Commissioner McDonald that if they were gonna do that anywhere, it should be in Sandy and Worry Township where they actually may have a project. Well, uh, it, that, that we did have it done by the township and I think a, one of the guys that does the county also. So I'm thinking, you know, this time of the year, they can work pretty efficiently. They can, you know, as things freeze up a little bit, they can do do a lot of that during the winter time. Steve, is that a clip once policy? <laughs> It was, gonna... actually, it was actually uh, 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 an effort to prop up the logging industry when Sappy went down in uh, Duluth, is my, sure. my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Cyril, I saw you raising your hand and it's great to have you with us. Do you wanna introduce yourself to the group? I don't think you've been with us yet and you've yeah. got a really exciting new role here in Minnesota. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I just thought I'd take the time to introduce myself. I'm Cheryl Glazer with Achieve Consulting. 
I'm excited to be uh, joining the conversation this morning. So thank you to Bernadine for um, making me aware of it and, and for Vince Robinson. So I'm going to be doing some work for the Minnesota Rural Broadband Coalition to help them with some strategic planning. So I'm super excited to begin that process. I'm interviewing uh, a few people for more like a focus group setting here to start with but then we'll be developing a full membership survey and also then facilitating a planning session in late November. So um, I'm excited to gain some insights and background information as I sit in on today's call and um, really look forward to working with this for the state. So thank you. Welcome, well, the Cheryl. Are, the rooms are all set. Um, I have it programmed for a 30 minute conversation, then you'll come back into this group. Um, you do have the option of um, leaving a room, as Bernadine mentioned, and then I can get you reassigned. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to say, Bernadine? I think we're pretty straightforward. So 30 minutes, we'll come back and just check in with each of the groups about how your conversations went, and then we'll do round two. I wanna thank Mark again for joining us to talk on the digital navigator one, because I know he's got a really busy day. So thanks for that, Mark. Here we go. All right. I think for some people it takes just a second for it to pop up. But hopefully most of you have access to choose. And the slower our broadband, the longer it takes? Yeah, probably. Uh, and there'll be a button that says join a breakout room and you have to click on it, at least for me, and then you'll see the options pop up. Thanks, Ann. Oh, you click first, join, and then the options come up. Okay. Yep. As the one that's usually putting together the breakup ro breakout rooms, I never see that part. Yeah. Mine is telling me to wait to be assigned. Who's this? Scott. Scott, where would you like to go? Remove affordability barrier, abandonment of copper networks, broadband as a public or private utility, speed goals, common ground to move Minnesota forward. Public or private utility. Okay. There you go. Yeah, if anyone else isn't, I, I, this is a brand new Zoom update. So if anyone else wants me to assign them, just speak up. Um, this is Eileen. Will you assign me to the affordability? I haven't had anything pop up on my screen. I'll sure do that. Thank you. And this is Barbara. I haven't had anything pop up on my screen too. I'll take affordability. There you go. There's a Glenn, I have no pop Thank up. Thank you. I'd like affordability. Glenn, affordability. Hi, Mary, this is Carl with uh, Lucerne County. Um, yep. I would be interested in the, uh, the life of copper. Sure. Hi, and Mary, Becky. this is Pat from Worry. Yes. Uh, any chance I could go to see about the digital navigators? No, that one is, that one did not get chosen. Oh, um, okay. I can, I can, <laughs> that one, yeah, and, um, uh, Mark was not offended by that. No. Um, <laughs> there's abandonment of copper networks, broadband as a public or private utility, common ground to move Minnesota forward on broadband, Minnesota speed goals. Let's do the common ground one to move forward then, please. All right, Pat. And Thank Jim, you. did you have a question? I see that Jim would like to go to affordability in the chat, oh. he mentioned. That's correct. Anyone else? Mary, yeah, you can Mary. send me the speed goals. This is Mark. I Mark Johnson, speed goals. Well, now we know how this Cheryl works. Cheryl, common ground. Cheryl, common ground. Michelle Thomas, common ground. Michelle Thomas, common ground. Bill Schaefer, abandonment of copper. All right, next. Dwayne Nelson, speed goals. 
All right. Anyone else have a decision? Kevin Olson, Common Ground. All right. Michael Wright, Public Private. All right. Chris Stark, Abandonment of Copper, please. There you go. Um, so there's only two people in broadband as a public or private utility. Does anyone want to go there? The other options are remove. I'll, I'll go to, um, I'll go there. This is Marianne. Thank you, Marianne. The other options are remove the affordability barrier, common ground to move Minnesota forward, Minnesota speed goals. Um, I'll go to the speed goal conversation. All right. Again, remove the affordability of broad, remove the affordability barrier, abandonment of copper networks, broadband as a public. Yeah. I'll go to copper. That's interesting. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Whitney. Here you go. Joanne? Could I do common ground, please? Sure. This is Molly Malone. Could I do affordability? Sure. Are you out there, Pat? You know where you want to go? Or type it into the chat box? I think Glenn is still kind of in limbo. Yeah, because he shows that he's joined, but um, it's like he's not here, but he has not yet joined. Well, he's in. He's in. Um, I think he's he's joined with two different devices because he's oh. in the first one, the affordability barrier. It shows him um, as joined, and then. Oh, okay. And then the other one is not joined. All right. Okay. So Pat, I don't know if you can hear me, but if, oh, oh, it looks like he just left. He left us. That actually wasn't a terrible way to do it. Even if it, even if, you know, the pick your own wasn't. Oh. I mean, it didn't take. That very, wasn't any more hassle than if we were in the room together. Right. Because you would have had to have said to a thousand times. That one's down the hall. That one's upstairs. That one's down. The Hold on. Let me see. That one's. Yep. Yep. You know. Oh, here comes Pat back again. Must be having technical difficulties. It's moving towards statewide. Um, the, the cable TV industry yeah. wanted everybody to do. Uh, yeah, I'm here, Mary. I'm having trouble with my internet at home. It keeps on kicking me off. So I'm, I'm on my phone, joined in on Zoom on my phone. Oh, okay. I thought uh, I was. I thought I heard Joanne. Uh, <laughs> What's that? I thought I heard Joanne Johnson. So that was really confusing for a minute. Companies. That must be who you're listening to right now. Yes. All right. Do you want me to try to put you in? That'd be great if you could. I don't know how long I'll stay, but okay. <laughs> I've been booted off four times already. So. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, That's just my internet service out here. It's terrible. Oh dear. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to put your computer in common ground then. Thank you. I can't remember. 
Well, that was new. Yeah, very interesting. I never had in the loads. So that was Joanne Johnson's voice, right? Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, why are we hearing her? Funny. So it looks like he's joined in there now. So All right. good. Good. All right. Do um, we want to stop the recording for a minute? Oh gosh. Sorry. I can Okay. Let's restart the recording so we don't forget. Look, everyone's back, or pretty close to being back. Great, super. So let's take a minute uh, to um, just check in with one another across our groups. And uh, we had, was it four or five, Mary? Five. Five. So, you know, let's take up, up to a minute from each group and just... Um, here back. What Mary, why don't you call them out by topic? Because you've got it there in front of you. And we want to share out to the group just some highlights from your conversation. And then we'll go to round two. How about speed goals? Mark had to leave. Sure. Um, no, Steve, I'm, you... I'm oh, still oh, here. I'm still here, but go ahead, Steve. That's fine. Yeah. Well, um, the state of Minnesota currently has speed goals for 2022 of 25 down, three up, and then in 2026, 100 down, 20 up. Uh, we had a lot of conversation about symmetrical goals rather than the 120, uh, that, that uh, perhaps there should be a recommendation uh, from this conference going back that um, <clears throat> the ultimate goal should be for symmetrical services. Even if you had 50-50, it's better than 120 because the up speed is, is uh, productivity. Um, and also there are 237,000 homes in Minnesota that do not have 25-3 service, if any connection. And uh, there should be a, a recommendation that future funding be targeted for those, um, those homes first. Uh, with state grant funding. Um, many of us are huge proponents of fiber where we know we're gonna get symmetrical service. Um, it's difficult to get fiber to the last mile in those rural locations, but uh, ultimately we'd like to see uh, symmetrical services across the state. And I just wanna give a shout out from representative Rob Eklund. He's been trying to join the conference, but uh, his broadband bandwidth is not working for him today. So he sent a text. So I just wanna say hello from Rob and he wants everyone to know he supports our efforts. We got to chat with him for a minute in the chat box about that very thing. So, And he got to listen to us talk about remote learning for a minute, so. Um, it was nice of him for, to join us today. So how do how about we remo move to the group? How to remove how to remove the barrier of affordability? Uh, this is Barbara speaking for the group. Uh, we had a really good discussion about how big the issue is and how there's potential legislative fixes. And uh, Diane Wells is in a group, and she shared that they did some provider surveys and found that. Some providers were far more generous than others, but didn't really want to make that publicly not <laughs> available, which is an interesting side of it, but I can understand why. And I shared that one of our providers has taken back clients who already owe them money and giving them the low, the low in income rate because there's a school issue there. And we talked about some of those strategies for how to do that. But the, what I came away with from our, from our discussion that we're going to do in Lee Sir County is we're going to take our speed test map and have one of our, our uh, bland and project people call all of those providers and ask them what they're doing, what their rates are, what's, what do they have low income rates and try to get us a better map of what's available here and try to get some transparency about that and work with the schools on getting that information out. 
also shared that we are with our CARES Act dollars have bought 100 devices and we prepaid the uh, expenses for those and some um, devices that'll go on emergency vehicles and some free Wi-Fi spots around the county. But that does that just pushes the issue out in terms of maintaining that long term. But it, it was a very good discussion of a big issue that not an easy answer. Thanks, Barbara. Um, what about why don't we hear from the group that talked about the abandonment of copper networks? Hi folks, Carl from Lesur County. I'm also on Barb Drawer Klein's team. And um, interesting conversation we had about uh, saying goodbye to copper. Um, in a way, copper has been kind of saying goodbye to us around here, you know. Um, slowly as the, the prevalence and distribution of cell phones and mobile assets have become, you know, more ubiquitous across the county, the support and infrastructure investment by Frontier and CenturyLink specifically has just been, uh, well, it's been non-existent to tell you the truth. And, you know, I talk about our Randy Van Sickles, our Mary Kellys, the office CEO person that was there for 30 years, you know, our Dickie Blaschkos, our Lisa and Matt that are out in the trenches up to their waiters, literally holding a hundred pair bundle to fix one person's problem and creating 10 issues down the road because it's literally falling apart in her hands. So when I bring her cookies and milk in the ditch on my way to work uh, and encourage her to, to support that for as long as possible, as Barb illustrated, we are looking at a short game, long game solution, leveraging on fixed wireless towers, seven of them across the county uh, with a 5G, 900 megahertz dual band coverage. The long game being 10 zones or regions of fiber optic build out happening right now uh, sparked and uh, primary impetus under CRF funding. And, um, and then concurrently with that under the Blandon Foundation grant, which was phenomenal uh, in the Purdue project, if you would agree, Barb, the last three weeks, connecting on the DAG, the digital asset group, uh, timing, synergistic uh, collaboration and events coming together have really allowed us to, uh, to see very clearly how the short game, long game option will eventually be able to, uh, to baby step us towards uh, fiber as an infrastructure across the county. Um, but then more importantly, on the long term, getting that last mile, the half mile, three quarter mile, one mile long driveways that we have to do around ponds, sloughs, swamps, and, and various other types of topology that we have in Lasura County. Thanks, Carl. We look forward to hearing more about the Digital Ready Community Program at 1045, I believe. Um, how about we move next to the people that talked about broadband as a public or private utility? Well, it started with uh, looking at our languaging, um, perhaps changing the, uh, the way we describe the issue to uh, re sort of reframe the problem. And the term that we sort of um, settled on was digital water. Um, the fact is we have people that are starving because they can't get digital water or it's disrupted or it's dirty. Um, another way to look at uh, things when your broadband drops or you can't hear somebody on the other line or, or the other end. Um, so it's a very real uh, problem in that we're you know, in danger of disenfranchising uh, large segments of the population if they don't have access to the digital water. So that um, suggests that a public-private um, solution is one to pursue. That, in fact, everybody has a right to access to electricity, access to food, transportation, et cetera. They should have access to digital water because without it, um, they're in danger of dying of thirst. And we see that especially now where even uh, a situation like this where people can't get on or they do, but they can't get clear communication. Um, if it was a critical path discussion, um, it changes the, the entire um, outcome potential. So one of the thoughts was changing the languaging uh, may help address the problem in a different way and perhaps come up with new solutions that are uh, more equitable and more accessible by more people. 
I hope I did it justice, Scott. Thanks, Michael. Thank you very much. Um, our last group was how do we find common ground to move the state forward on broadband? So I was taking some notes. This is Bill Coleman. Uh, it's important to really identify an issue uh, that an ad hoc group could attack to uh, discuss and come up with recommendations. So having just getting together on a wide variety of issues is more like the governor's broadband task force. Uh, so it's um, having that uh, problem statement to be specific is important, as is getting a good representative group. Uh, you know, kind of like the three bears, you'd want it to be about the right size, not too big, not too small, uh, in the medium size. And then, you know, the conveners for this could be uh, really any group with some standing. So whether that's one of the, the AMCs of the League of Minnesota Cities or the Broadband Coalition or the Minnesota Telecom Alliance, Office of Broadband might have some roles with some issues. Uh, other ones, maybe they'd be better off uh, staying away from. Uh, but then we talked about the kind of topics that uh, um, um, uh, that you could uh, convene or you know come to some good resolutions on. Some would be on the border to border broadband grant uh, criteria and priorities. Uh, dig once uh, railroad right of way issues, and then maybe some middle mile collaboration strategies that would uh, encourage the use of more collaborative middle mile uh, fiber optics. And so that was. Um, what our group talked about. Joanne, do you want to add anything to that? Nope, you did that good. Thank you. Well, that is all of our groups. Um, so I wanted to share my screen here quickly. Um, are you seeing the four topics we have for open space the next round? Yes. All right, good, because it's kind of confusing on my two screens here. Um, so in addition to the ones we already talked about, I also check out the digital navigators since Mark had to leave. Um, but as you can see here, these are the four topics we have left and we could add a couple more if anyone has any suggestions. Mary, you know, I, I don't think Mark's the only one who knows about digital navigators. I think there's other folks who might be really interested in that topic. So I'd advocate for putting that back in. Okay. I want to share with the group that um, Jane Leonard was hoping to be with us this morning for president of growth and justice, but she's hiking on the superior trail, but she did send in a question. Uh, she said, um, as somebody who's worked for many years in this space, her uh, open space question would be, um, and it's kind of similar, but a little different to the, you know, is broadband a utility question? Is it, what would it take to, to make a commitment as a state and to understand we need ongoing investment in broadband access and adoption? It's that kind of base budget idea. Um, you know, how do we get broadband funding as an ongoing, commitment, recognition and support that it's an ongoing commitment for Minnesota investment. And we'll pull these again. So if you um, to see which rooms that we want, we want to actually open up. I think that's a, a great topic item, Bernadine. Um, can we combine that with uh, number three? It because it, it seems like they're they're similar and love uh, it, love it. That's a great idea, Carol. Let's do that. Let's have that as a you bet, and we yeah, can you can carry um, that idea um, into number three. Good. Yeah, Becky Laurie is a is a representative too, also to the legislature that had some really good uh, points and conversations in our breakout session, and those two fall really in line with with that intention. Thanks, Carl.
Are there any others or are these five adequate? Last call for other conversation topics. And I think if we just stick with this five, I'll just make these the rooms and if one of them doesn't sure. have any, um, if one doesn't have any people in it, we'll just send those people to other rooms. So this is a good time for some friendly banter because I have to get the rooms sorted out. But just give me hey, a This couple. isn't banter exactly, but uh, when does the digital asset group presentation begin? I was thinking it was at 1015. In which 1045. Case 1045. <laughs> Thank you. Otherwise, gotta go. Breathe, Jim, breathe, breathe. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good. Just, uh, yeah. It's not well oh. marked in my notes. So we'll transition in this uh, meeting into that meeting. Yes, we like will. Yeah, um, we're, it's the same link. We're going to just flow when we're done with our second round and report out. We'll turn to that next. Excellent. I was a little distracted during our first breakout session, um, wrapping up my uh, notes and edits on our operational agreement for, for the DAG. So I'm now, now I'm well prepared. I can just chill out and enjoy this next breakout. Look at you slinging all those new acronyms, Jim, the DAG. Yep. Yeah, I've got a whole new set of acronyms to propose to change from the DAG to other things, but that's a whole other conversation. Jim, I feel a little bit like Scooby-Doo when we talk about the DAG. <laughs> right. Well, the world needs more three-letter acronyms. Nothing a TLA can't solve. Hey, TLA is my acronym. That's what we call my cabin, Tamarack Lake Association. Because back in the day, my parents purchased it collaboratively with four other families and they had it kind of as a joint you know, thing. So TLA is my acronym. My 10-year-old uh, just joked uh, or asked if TLA meant uh, tender loving acronym. Oh, cute. All right, everyone. Um, enough banter? Enough banter. We can go that. ahead and get started. I'm going to open up the rooms. And for those of you that can hit join room and then pick one, go ahead and do that. The rest of you will just let me know verbally. That worked pretty well. So here you go. Mary, this Scott said you put me in the legislative action section. Yes. Mary, uh, Carl from LeSueur County. Um, mm -hmm. I would go into the digital navigators group that uh, runs right along with that DAG conversation coming up. Carl, digital navigators? Yeah, thank you. Uh, there we go. Next. Mary, this is Eileen. You can send me over to the legislative group. Okay. This is Barbara. You can send me to the telemedicine one. All right. This is Cheryl. Send me to the legislative group, please. All right. Mary, Pat, you can send me to the legislative group as well. Okay. There you go. Mary, this is Pat. Could I go to the digital navigators, please? Yes. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. You know, Dwayne Nelson put me in the digital navigators as well. All right. Thank you. Anyone have any questions on what the rooms are? Yeah, oh. could you run those down again, Mary? I had to step out. Sure. We have, how do we get to symmetrical service? 
What is the role of broadband in mental health healthcare delivery? What are our ideas for more effective legislative engagement and rural advocacy, including ongoing investment? Um, what is the definition of a good broadband map and how do we go about creating them in the digital navigators program? Oh, thanks. Um, you could put me in the legislation group. Who's this? Uh, this is Mary Ann, sorry. All right. And you, I'm sorry that- Thank you, Laura. Wait. Mary Ann, what, what was your group again? Uh, legislation. All right. And now Becky Lori. Um, symmetrical, I need to get balanced. All right, <laughs> <laughs> you sure do. Uh, um, this is Molly Malone, could I go to the legislative one, please? All right. Mary, this is Eileen again, I didn't leave. Um, but oh. you can send me to symmetrical this instead of, I was gonna go legislative, but I'll go symmet symmetrical. Well, hopefully this will work for you. Hi, Mary, uh, you can send me to symmetrical. This is Kevin. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Mary, this is Bill. I'll go to Digital Navigator. Thanks, Bill. I'll go to Digital Navigator. Bernadine? Yep. Whitney, do you, do you know where you want to go? I think, was it number three, the rural advocacy? Was that? Legislative advocacy and funding. You want that one? I guess. Sounds good. <laughs> Eileen, are you still having difficulties? Yes, I'm the problem child here. Oh. Um, if you go down below, is there like, is there like a breakout rooms? It does say join. There it is. There you go. It's very interesting that no one wanted to talk about broadband mapping. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm just gonna let, we've had a couple people join us. I'm just gonna let people know that we've, we're just coming out of our second breakout room from our open space conversations. And we're just gonna do a quick report back. And then we're gonna hear about the Digital Ready Communities program that for our three of our community, Minnesota communities have been participating in over the last month. So if we just wanted to take a minute um, for each group to report back, um, can we hear from Symmetrical Service first? Sure, we just had a lot of conversation about a lot of different things. Um, so Symmetrical Service was just part of, part of our discussion. Um, uh, talked a lot about the challenges of providers working together um, so that companies who are local can serve um, people. So we just we kind of went all over the place um, and talked about the importance of symmetrical service and that it is here now, it is possible. It's just how do you once again pay for it and how do you pay for it in communities where they don't really qualify for any of the border to border or any of the other grants because they're serving mostly residential. Um, so we've talked a lot about how do you design a program for people who are falling through the cracks. Becky and Kevin, did I hit everything? Yeah. Yep. I think uh, you did a good job. And then also what type of technology do you pick for symmetrical service because sometimes anything with a shared network, perhaps cable modem, fixed wireless, there are definitely are limitations on, on upload anyway uh, because it is a shared service where fiber to the home or premise is the preferred technology since it's a dedicated technology. So at a minimum, we thought, you know, 
middle mile fiber, fiber to the community in some of these areas, even if it's not to the home, get it into the community and then partner with other um, other companies to do that last mile, if anything. Well, thank you. Um, we had a couple people talking about mental health and telehealth care delivery. GM's going to speak. Sorry for the rest. delay there. I, uh, I minimized yeah. my window right before you introduced us and had to dig it back up again with all my windows and tabs. Um, yeah, we had a great little session. Um, it was uh, Barbara and me for most of the time. Um, and a number of uh, great ideas popped out. Uh, Barbara gave me my very favorite uh, kind of gift, which is a fantastic idea that I hadn't heard of before for um, essentially helping the community. And that was uh, something that they tried to do but couldn't actually get launched in California um, and that we may pr try to pursue here where um, this would be after the election. Uh, you basically use the voter registration rolls and call people up and ask them how they're doing. I believe her plan was to target uh, people 80 and older um, and have um, quali people qualified actually making the calls to deal with any health, mental health crises or whatever that might come up. And I, can, I would imagine having a list of local and online resources that people could tap into, but just a check-in, a cold call check-in. Hey, you know, we're calling from wherever. How are you doing in these trying times? And I think that's a great idea. We talked about how um, many church congregations do things like that, but that typically only reaches the congregation or they might choose to reach a wider market. But um, for those that aren't part of a congregation um, or part of any faith uh, whatsoever, um, this broader spectrum approach could be a really good idea. Um, you just have to come up with the people to do it, the organization to be behind it and whatever funding would be required. But I'm gonna uh, run that by some of our healthcare providers, uh, Kuchiching Aging Options in town is right now doing a, a major review of all the mental health issues, um, new ones, things that are being addressed well, things that aren't, um, and other um, uh, organizations in our area that can address some of those needs out there. So that's good. I also mentioned uh, something that's been advertised a lot on my podcast, betterhelp.com, I think it is, um, which is uh, basically one-on-one -on -one mental health counseling but done entirely through an online platform. Um, and I'm sure they're doing great business these days. It is, uh, it is not free, um, although it's possible you can possibly get that paid for with insurance uh, money as well, I don't really know. Um, but that is an additional resource, which I'm gonna ask for our local mental health professionals to vet. Um, we are losing numbers of mental health professionals in our community as they retire and such and aren't being replaced at the same, uh, at the same level. So I'm going to ask them to kind of vet if they think this is a legitimate resource to know uh, for people to use. And then if they agree, then through them, ideally, um, share knowledge of that and any similar options that exist for an online platform for mental health with our healthcare providers and mental health care uh, providers and social service organizations. That's probably enough for our review. We need to move along. Thanks, Jim. How about the legislative advocacy group? Anyone from the legislative advocacy group? Whitney, go ahead, Whitney. All right, all right. We, um, I was, just, I had taken some notes, so it's probably good. I can report back. Uh, we talked about some of the barriers, and we were really kind of talking about the rural-urban divide. You know, the money from the lobbyists of the providers that you know maybe aren't meeting our current goals or desires for broadband connectivity you know they have a lot of money that talks at the legislature so that you know the rural broadband Co coalition has taken a major step in, in in addressing that by having the coalition and the lobbyists in place um, representing what the communities and the members would like to see we talked a little bit about the complicated terms right 
we got megabytes, we have um, different technologies, fixed wireless, cell phone. I know my own friends that are fairly well educated don't understand. And there's a survey for broadband in Cherry Township and I text my best friend and she hasn't taken it yet. Like, what are you doing? She's got a master's degree in psychology and a great job, but she doesn't realize that she could be getting a fiber to the home broadband project instead of using her cell phone. Right, those kind of things, that, that the complicated terms and the local education is so important. And then of course we talked about the need for sustainable funding. Um, I, 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 we didn't quite touch on this in the group, but broadband projects take a lot of time to plan. I mean, you fund a project and it doesn't happen for two years sometimes. So um, what, what do we say we need in economic development? Some sort of certainty. So some sort of certainty in the funding for broadband would probably help things move forward better, <laughs> faster, I don't know. <laughs> so I don't know if anyone else has any other comments. We talked a little bit about, you know, one way to address some of the fact that people still don't seem to understand is to continue to put out um, materials at that level of understanding that would be helpful. We also talked a little bit about finding ways to take advantage of the current challenges with distance learning as a way to create heightened understanding um, of what's happening around this issue. I wasn't in this group. This is Becky Laurie. Can you hear me with my bad up speed upload? We can hear oh. you real quick. Okay, I turned my picture off so you can see me now. I was in the symmetrical services group and I learned so much. So I would just like to throw out to all of you um, and, and those of you who lobby at the legislature with me that Kevin Olson from Cooperative Light and Power from Two Harbors was in our group and he had such good stories and um, uh, about how to get it uh, into the, the barriers to getting this um, uh, fiber to, to, um, to residential areas and a, a cabin seasonality. And so I took all these notes for when we go lobby again. And I just wanted you to know, get a hold of Kevin, Bill, get a hold of Kevin next time we go lobbying because his arguments were so understandable and powerful. Thanks, Becky. Can we hear from one last group, the Digital Navigators? Yeah, I'll report. Um, uh, digital Navigators is a concept that was created by the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, and they have materials and a job description on their website. We've seen schools really take the lead in digital navigation for families trying to get connected uh, through the uh, pandemic. And so they've been uh, developing some very good roles and, and uh, uh, as the nav they're both navigators uh, and uh, implementers to try and improve connectivity with open access Wi-Fi and mobile vans and then trying to move people to real connections. We know that the people who are uh, lacking digital connections many times have other issues, uh, low incomes, uh, failure to attend school online, food uh, issues, as well as <laughs> access. So sometimes a package approach to uh, the communities is important. They've been using the speed tests, the maps from the speed tests to really uh, identify the best providers in given areas. Uh, we see the Office of Broadband Development functioning uh, as a digital navigator, working with educators from the top down, uh, 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 doing translation, and uh, uh, also seeing homeless advocates is a big part of this digital uh, navigator piece. And Diane really talked about the uh, need to have a trusted community group, a neighborhood or a cultural group that could really participate in that. And so really it's a question of how do you expand from the school of focus to community wide focus. That's it. Thanks. Yeah, hey, thanks hey, for that, I Bill. Have question. I have a quick question. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, 
is that the name of the website, Digital Digital Navigators? No, it's a search for NDIA. 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 N is in Nancy, D is in David, I is in. It's okay. now in the it's it's now in the chat box. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. That was Thanks, great. Thanks, Alex. Wow. Well, good job, everybody. I appreciate everybody hanging in there and kind of walking with us through an attempt to set up an opportunity to have informal conversation on topics we care about. And um, I, I hope that that was generative and that I know in the couple groups I was in, there was a lot of connections happening. Um, and it was fun and interesting to see from, I think for all of us, just what topics, right? People want to care, want to talk about how the, and as Michael, right, who's with us this morning and I've been uh, chatting privately, um, the words we use, you know, how we talk about it, uh, the names we give to the issues and the issues we pick is all in and of itself from kind of a meta perspective, interesting. What are the hot topics that people who care about broadband want to huddle up around today? So thanks everybody for the, um, for taking the time to invest in having conversations with others in our, in our broadband, in our dispersed broadband community here in Minnesota. We're going to transition now to talking um, more about um, uh, hearing about the digital asset group project um, and Bill's comments about trust and what Diane had to say is a great bridge to our next session. We know that as I've certainly experienced that in this time of COVID feels like nothing's in such sort, short supply as civic trust. I noticed in their keynote yesterday, um, Deb Socia of the Enterprise Institute in Chattanooga shared with us her wisdom. She called out trust as the number one factor that communities need to succeed to meet their broadband goals. Because she was talking about trust between partners, between organizations in the community, and hopefully with your providers as well. Um, I been experiencing in these times of COVID um, that it's really hard to build trust and certainly easy to lose it. My dad used to quote um, Winston Churchill to me. Maybe you guys have heard this famous quip from him. He said that to build may have to be the slow and laborious task of years. To destroy can be the thoughtless act of a single day hard to build trust, easy to lose it. Um, some of you know that I have the background in Soviet area studies. And so um, I always think about, I've got in this, in, I have this like bell ringing in my head. What is to be done, right? That famous book by Nikolai Chernyshevsky and then Vladimir Lenin wrote the same, wrote a, the title, his book, the same. What is to be done? What are we gonna do given this? fact that trust is so critical to making progress and it's fragile, hard to build, easy to lose. So enter are the teams presenting our next session. We're gonna be um, hearing from three rural Minnesota communities who've been participating across this month of October in Purdue University's Digital Ready Community Program. And uh, we got folks with us here from, from Kuchiching, Lesur and Rock Counties, um, who are the among the rock stars of our blind and broadband community cohort. You guys are amazing. And I'm um, really excited that we're gonna be hearing directly from them here this morning. Um, the Digital Ready Community Program was developed by the Purdue specialists and educators with the explicit goal of increasing civic trust and engagement by using digital platforms. So these participating communities, they form this digital asset group. I've been ribbing uh, Jim Yant about that he's got a new sexy acronym, the DAG, Digital Asset Group. We're gonna hear about that. Their inventory of digital assets, what that is in a community and how they're gonna use that to develop a community-wide digital engagement plan. Um, we are excited in Minnesota for this partnership. Really grateful to Roberto Gallardo and his team from Purdue for piloting this here in Minnesota um, across the month and uh, glad to have them with us today in their communities to report out. And I'm, 
I, I'm going to pass the baton now to um, our guest from Purdue University. Uh, and Mary, does, are they here? I haven't, I've been looking at yeah. they Yeah, online? Emily was here. Great. There she yeah. is. Yep. Good morning. Hey. Um, yes, I'm Emily Del Real, and I'm an engagement specialist with the Purdue Center for Regional Development. Um, Roberto couldn't join the meeting this morning, but he and I have been working with these three counties over the past uh, three weeks um, on the condensed digital ready community program we have. And you described uh, the program perfectly. Um, we are just really working to gain community trust. Um, and just be able to be responsive to the community. Um, so we were very excited and had a lot of fun working with Kachuchun, Lesur, and Brock on this. Um, so as it was mentioned, they formed their DAG, um, that's the Digital Assets Group. Um, that includes their community stakeholders, including local government, um, just to be able to leverage digital platforms to help increase civic engagement. Um, and again, trust, which is critical. Um, it sounds like um, you've already given a brief update on what we have done and I really want to focus um, on the counties and let you describe what they've been working on. So um, Jim Yount, do you want to go ahead and start off and explain um, what you've learned and talk about your operational agreement? Sure. Um, so I am the chair of the Kuchiching uh, Technology Initiative, which is a citizens committee of the county. Um, and that's great because they take our calls and listen to what we have to say. And one of the commissioners is actually on our group and we have a good uh, mesh of people in that. And we think that our digital assets group is gonna effectively be a subcommittee of the Kuchiching Technology Initiative. The missions are uh, very sim similar. The, the scope is similar um, other than the DAG is more narrowly focused on the communication issue. Um, and of course, this being a pilot project, we weren't entirely sure what it was that we were uh, getting into, and that has um, evolved and become uh, more clear over time. Um, and what the operational agreement uh, ended up focusing on is uh, creating a network of um, organizations and individuals who are active primarily in social media, although it doesn't have to be uh, social media, that have basically communication channels to some subset of the community. Um, and then to have a, a list of those organizations that are willing to participate in getting messages out to the whole community through the individual small networks, because communication these days is very fractured. Um, and then also a list of the digital assets of each of those uh, members in the network. So they may have a Facebook page, they may have a web page, they may have a digital sign um, on that side of their building or anything like that. Um, and then we worked on basically a, a set of guidelines, rules, operational uh, structure for um, how to communicate what kind of messages uh, to the community through those, um, through that network of participants. Um, and the model is, is pretty good. Um, my one uh, concern with it, well, it's not a concern exactly, it is an excellent way to communicate important messages to the community is get it out as widely as possible emphasis on uh, emergency messages like oh and um also new information like hey the vaccine is now available in our community you might want to go get it and here's where you can get it that kind of information um and also there was much discussion of trying to make sure there weren't uh too many messages coming out it should need to be a broad community interest and not so many that you just ignore it as a bunch of noise which is what i tend to do it's the main reason i don't have a <laughs> i don't use a facebook account. um i have one I use it. um so that's all great. Uh, we were hoping that there would be more um, discussion of how to do community engagement as part of this. That is not part of the operational agreement as currently structured, but we would like to also um, work on community engagement in our community where we're getting feedback from the public to the organizations and the community leaders, et cetera. I don't know if that would have been part of the, uh, the uh, not crash course version of the pilot project, or if it may, I'm guessing that Purdue also works on that kind of thing as well. Um, but that's something that our group um, is certainly interested in, and we may explore whether that is part of the uh, digital asset group per se, or just many of the same individuals um, continuing to push uh, community engagement because that trust that was mentioned at the beginning, you know, that 
only can really be built with a two-way uh, communication flow. If it's all one way, there can be trust involved, but um, that engagement is a, a critical thing that we want to see added as well. So there's a little bit of information about that. What, if I may ask, what county were you from? Kuchiching County, right on the Canadian border next to Voyager's National Park, Rainy Lake and all that. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you for that update, Jim. Um, and just to, to respond to what Jim mentioned about an engagement. And one thing is, and, and Roberta and I may not have explained this well enough um, during our sessions, but you're actually not done yet. We do have a few more things to do with you and you'll, sure. you'll be excited because part of that is developing an engagement plan. Um, so what will be happening um, and I'll go ahead. I was going to talk about this at the end, but since Jim mentioned it, so what will be happening over the next couple of months is that one of our, um, one of my colleagues from Purdue will be working with the counties on a community survey about engagement within the community. And then in January, these counties will be reviewing the survey results and from that developing a digital engagement plan. Um, so while this is a condensed version of our program, there's still quite a bit of activity. Um, and then these two activities that we've got coming up, we anticipate completing at least by March. Um, so um, conducting the survey and completing the digital engagement plan. That's excellent, Emily. Thank you for adding that. Yeah, you're welcome. Jim, we'll be... you, Jim do you see Allison's question in the chat box? Could you respond oh. to that? I just saw that there was something in the chat. Uh, let's see, do you have a guess as to what proportion of the county is tapped into digital communication? Um, so we have a very poor county. We have limited uh, broadband access um, and, and we're working on those issues as well as interesting technology initiative. What portion have digital communication? I don't know, um, maybe 60 to 90% um, have some degree of digital communication, um, you know, but, which I would include as, you know, just having a Facebook account. Um, maybe they can't access it at home, you know, who knows, but, you know, we don't really have good information on the a level of penetration of that. Kevin Grover, our school superintendent just popped in. Maybe he wants to chime in on that specific question. No, and, and I've been on, I just have my camera off and I was just going to comment and I think you hit it correctly. It, it, it's very similar in many counties from the school when we went digital learning last spring, that was a major hurdle. Now, there's a difference between being able to connect to Facebook on your phone at certain places compared to being able to upload images or run a business or, you know, and, and so as we've transitioned to, you know, um, more digital learning, we're, we're in a hybrid model at the high school um, and elementary, so to speak. That's that's the hurdle is we we don't, you know, a good chunk of our well, especially when you get two kids at home and maybe a parent that's working from home, the broadband to you know handle that is different than do they have Instagram, do they have Facebook, do they have you know access to the web on a phone or internet? So I, I agree. I don't even from a school standpoint have um a percentage that is connected. And of course, the other option is we bought hotspots, different alternatives, but it's a short term thing. It, they don't have high speed internet um, buried in a good chunk of areas and in even places. And Steve is on here, Georgie, you know, we have providers that, you know, people have internet, but it doesn't meet the demands yet you know so um i don't have an exact percentage so jim i think you hit it good but it's it's more to it than just yeah 60 percent have internet at the home well if that's the correct answer how many pro works properly and could handle the demand in this day and age is a whole nother question sure and allison i don't know if it was implicit in your question but you know i'm certainly well aware that not everyone is has has access to any digital communication channel. So even though we talked about digital asset group and other things like that, you know, including digital signs, which you can drive by and see, you know, things like that. But, um, you know, absolutely the, the newspaper should be um, one of the channels that we consider. They should be getting the messages that we decide are important to the whole community and they can choose to print them or not. They certainly are, have adopted also to the modern age and have a active website and a whole lot of Facebook feedback. <laughs> As you can imagine, on various stories, people always have something to say. 
Um, and but you know this is evolving into something that can help at least in part address what is a universal issue. In all the organizations that I'm involved in, um, all have this question of how do we communicate with people and not there's no one platform that everyone is on. Not everyone gets the newspaper. Not everyone watches uh, listens to the radio. Um, not everyone is on Facebook, et cetera. So what do you do? Are you going to have you know a whole communications team that's trying to communicate on you know a dozen different platforms to get your message out? Well, you got to pick a couple and stick with them. Um, but for the messages that are of the, the greatest priority or the broadest interest, that's what the operational agreement we've developed is designed to do to get those messages out. It doesn't it doesn't help the Rotary Club, you know, get every little bit of news they would like to get out to everyone. But it helps the ones that are high priority and very broad interest. Again, also making sure the volume doesn't get to be so much that people just stop uh, start ignoring all of our communications. It's a good approach. Can I just quickly introduce myself and thank you for that, Jim. This is Allison Ashan. I work with Bernadine and Mary at the foundation. And um, I have a special interest in news and information and how um, rural communities in particular um, <laughs> navigate this very increasingly complex world of trying to get the word out. And I'm part of the Itasca County Public Health team that's been working during the pandemic to do those kinds of things. Anyway, I wanted to introduce myself in case any of you guys would like to engage with me on um, those topics. So I wanted to make sure I said hi. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you. Well, excellent. So Kala, did, yeah, Kala, do you wanna go ahead for Rock County? Yes, good morning. My name is Kala Jarvie. I'm the library director here in Rat County. We're pretty much the opposite of Jim. We're in the way southwest corner on the border of South Dakota and Iowa. So we're way down, down south in the corner. We actually have fantastic broadband here in Rat County. We have border to border broadband, which is just unreal. It's, it's fantastic. The, the broadband we have was, we, we got it through a, through a state grant and we worked with a co-op here called Alliance Communications. They, they operate outside of the city limits of Laverne where I am right now. So the, the rural areas of Rock County actually have better internet than town, which is just awesome. I mean, not for the townsfolk like me, but it's great for great for everyone. You know, I grew up in out in the country in South Dakota. And if the wind was not blowing right, then you couldn't get internet. But that is not the case here anymore in Rock County. And um, here in Rock County, we are wrapping up our uh, Bland and Broadband Community Grant. We were fortunate enough to participate in that with Landon for the, the last, well, it got extended. So, you know, last couple of years now. And we are, we wanted to continue to harness that excitement and this great team we have. And so it's been a great transition to, you know, keep that momentum going and to participate in the digital ready communities. So like I said, we have this fantastic broadband and a huge focus of what we did in our BBC group is, you know, great broadband, okay, but it doesn't do any good if people aren't using it or don't know how to use it. So that was kind of our focus was um, education and making sure that people had access to it. You know, we, we gave away, uh, 60 PCs through a group called PCs for People so that that people in our community could have that um, those devices to access access the internet. And so in working with Purdue and it's and all the other um, the other groups in um, in the digital ready communities we've we've learned so much already and it's only been a couple of weeks and we have lots of work to do but it's it's really going to be beneficial we learned um, Jim talked about digital assets in the community um, when you stop to think about it we there are so many more digital assets than we ever really considered. We, that's not something that you, that we really thought about. When we thought digital assets, we thought like, oh yeah, the, the school, the, the newspaper, their websites, their Facebook pages and all that. But then you really stop to think about it and it is the, the, the boutique down the street 
their Facebook page, the, of course, us at the library, our Instagram page, like there's so many digital assets and it's so important to be able to know what they are and who's running them. And that's something that we'll be evaluating on a frequent basis. And so having that information is just another key part of being able to spread this important information across the community. And so I think once we get our operational agreement in place, like Jim said, we don't want to overload with information. We don't want people to see like, oh, there's another thing from the, from the DAG, who cares? So we want to be very, very cautious and careful with what we say and save it for the very, very important things. Um, an example I gave at our last DRC meeting is that Rock County a couple of weeks ago recently had community-wide COVID testing for free. Anyone who wanted to, symptoms or no, could come and get a COVID test. And that's the kind of thing that we would have wanted to put out if we had had our, our, um, our operational agreement and the DAG fully in place. That's something we would have wanted to, to get out to our community. And we want to we want to try and eliminate, I know we can't, that's kind of a lofty goal, but we want to really cut down on people saying, oh, I didn't know about that, especially when it comes to very important things like this, or, you know, the, we had to drive through flu shot clinics, just very important information that benefits the entire community is what we're focusing on. So we're not going to do things like Ace Hardware is having a sale, but it's going to be things like, hey, here's where you need to go to register to vote and things like that. And uh, we think it's especially important now with COVID because more people are staying home and they're getting their information from, from Facebook, from other social media. So we wanna make sure to capitalize on that as much as we can. Okay, I think Sarah is going to talk about Lesur County, unless anybody has questions for Kala. I, I have a general question, if I may. Of course. I put a, a thing up here on the that in involving getting these, the network together, did you use city council, township boards and school districts uh, as part of the groups? Mm -hmm. For the, uh, the digital assets groups? Well, as, as you were getting, gathering people together to set the groups up, did you use those, those unities or government unities to to uh, assist you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did here in Rock County. We have a, a county commissioner on our board. We have some two uh, city city employees. We've got one from the school. So we did use those channels to gather people for our group. Of course, it's, everyone's very busy. And I'm sure that is the yep. case across the state. So it was very helpful to be able to go to those boards and say, hey, could we have maybe just even one person to represent this this sector so yes we did we did utilize those channels well that's good because uh you know they're a good conduit to the public mm -hmm. and to get those involved sometimes is hard but uh they're mostly for the most part elected officials so they should be happy to try to get their organizations that they're voted from to get involved. So, which is not always the case, but I mean, it's a good, uh, that's something every county has. So, mm -hmm. thank you. For, um, for Kutichin County, we also did uh, engage those groups. It was Kutichin Technology Initiative, which kind of took this pilot project under its wing. Um, and we are an official county uh, citizens group. So that, 
partly checked that box already, but we had active participation from the school district, Kevin Grover there, um, from well, one of our cities, two of our cities, um, and uh, the county and a, a variety of organizations as well. But it's also worth distinguishing, um, we've come up with the terminology digital asset group is the core group of people that are you know, reviewing messages, creating, it's a, it's a tight group. We said that, that it shouldn't be more than 10 to 12 people and you know, six is probably perfectly fine to be functional. Um, and they don't represent every organization, of course. But then there's the broader network of organizations that will participate in getting those messages out. That's a different and much bigger group. And obviously, that is needs to be very inclusive. Um, but we also, of course, we're trying to set guidelines as to dealing with uh, miscommunication. If our message gets uh, altered as it gets uh, distributed and what to do with the feedback that is inevitable on social media, not all of which will be positive when to reply, when not to reply, how to reply. Um, those are all issues that we um, uh, tried to address as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because um, county commissioners sometimes are involved in so many efforts that uh, in order to really, really get their attention, uh, when you get cities, township boards, and school districts involved in the situation, it, it has a tendency to get their attention much faster. So that's just been my experience. So thank you. Uh, Sarah, did you want to talk about what LeSueur has done and what they've learned in your operational agreement? Um, sure. And to answer you, Alex, our broadband group has also incorporated membership from we're a county group, so and a county that has four school districts and several cities, and so we have included elected officials and county staff as well. Um, Lasur County is located just south of the Twin Cities metropolitan area, uh, so we're right across the border from that statistical location. And we've been working on planned and broadband for four years, like Rock and Cooch and have also gotten to employ some very important goals in our work. And our ideas about how to use the DAG are very similar to what Jim and Calla are talking about. For us in the county, our project has come, this um, Purdue project has come along at exactly the perfect time. The synergy of it is just incredible. Um, and uh, as a broadband community during the last two years, We've been making tremendous strides forward to improve door-to-door -door reliable internet access. And through that, we've had the tremendous backing of the county board. They're solidly behind us and that's really helped us achieve our goals. Um, and this asset uh, has even increased with the Pandemic CARES Act funding and we've already been working with county department heads to create new communication environment facing out to the citizens. Um, so we've been having these discussions and talking about the frustrations of reaching just as every singular person in the county. And the goal is, is that if we reach them, we can engage them. Um, so the input of the county leaders has been key. And really they're the ones that are intimately aware of the communication challenges existing within the county. You know, those department heads really know where the barriers are. And several members of our Bland and Broadband group are now working with the county on a contract basis, using our individual skills with the shared goal to improve broadband and communications within the county. Um, Jim had talked a little bit about fractured communication these days, and I have a little history for you about media in our county. Just 20 years ago, we had five independent newspapers and an independent radio station. And um, now one newspaper group publishes three different independent community newspapers that all have local offices on the east side of our county but the remaining two have been folded into one and that publication is managed outside of the county. There's not even an office in the county, but they still have a strong commitment to cover the county. Um, and then there is a regional 
newspaper, two radio stations focused on regional news and a TV network TV station based in Mankato. So um, setting out our goal, we've, we've been finding ways to uh, enhance the county's website for the outfacing person. And we've just begun an effort to use the four main social media platforms. And I mean, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn about how the county is using CARES Act dollars and broadband funding, spending that to enhance the county. Um, then those four social media platforms carry the same posts, um, but are, those are separate pages from the county, the, the pages that the county departments already operate. And since we all know those routes are not always reaching the community, we've been struggling with ways to connect that seem valid, trusted, and reachable. So that's why we're so excited about the, the Purdue project. Um, we just can't get to where we need to be with broadband unless we find a way to communicate about it with the citizens. And then the same is true about all the really neat stuff our county is doing with CARES Act funding. Um, so the, uh, and also a side note is that our county has used CARES Act money to not only assist citizens financially, economically in, as individuals, but also to enhance broadband. Um, so we clearly see how the digital engagement plan will help us increase trust and community engagement by using the influence that's already established by social media users across the county. Um, and they can be private or public or business entities. And we now see an effective way to get into the trenches and send out our messages via the, the digital action group. Um, as guided by the operational agreement. Um, and this guidance has been exactly what we've needed. It's as if the answer kind of fell in our laps. So thank you. Um, it was a tough decision to go with the program just because of that busy word, but we're really, really glad that we made time. Um, something that, that I talk about in the digital landscape is what you don't know, you don't know. Um, so this plan will help us avoid some of the pitfalls along the way. Um, we knew some of those challenges prior to engaging the program, but we couldn't see a way past them. So as a larger group, the, the three groups we've identified opportunities like the human factor and how it might bend a message and differences in communication platforms and how they can be used to leverage the message. Um, and so um, now we feel like we can reach out to individuals. Um, our group, of course, will achieve our must list to enhance public safety and health and to provide information. And it looks like that that's what we can get done during the first year. But it, in thinking ahead about it, we want to use it for building our list of dreams like tourism coordination and sharing information about arts and agriculture. In our mind, it can become a well-rounded economic development tool um, because it supports that coordinated messaging across the digital space. Um, and a little, Kala touched on this a little bit, but these ideas have also helped put us to ease about how to share our message truthfully or how to correct them and respond to comments. Um, it's interesting to me that the pilot group is discussing doing this and um, somehow with a completely different digital or communications landscape, the message is the same as it was when I was a kid in college studying public relations. In the early 1980s, the Tylenol poisoning case was fresh in everybody's mind and it provided the lesson then and now that you just simply tell the truth the entire story, have the facts readily available, and don't assume or add conjecture or um, add opinion, and then repeat as necessary. Um, I think that we also look that moving forward, it's important to set the stage to, so the digital operating agreement that we've arrived at as a group will run for one year. So then 
the membership can change after the first year. And so it'll be important to set the stage to have great membership for the group in future years. Um, and to include individuals and in in all age groups so that we can continually assess the digital assets and how to use them. Um, and probably that'll change the operating agreement over time too. Um, it, and as I developed the presentation, it occurred to me that the DAG is almost like having a child, that we intend to give it our best and send it out into the world and, and serve future needs. And I'm just thinking about 10 years down the road, wh where will it be at that point or even in 25 years? So actually it's best that it's an independent creature so that it can adapt to what the future of the digital landscape offers. And of course, Blandon, we wanna thank you so much. And Emily, um, you and Roberto and Purdue Extension. And of course, our friends at Cooch and Rock, um, we really had fun. Well, I know Roberto and I just um, thoroughly enjoyed working with all of you and it was, um, you know, you got to be our guinea pigs and we shared that with you. We were honest. We, this is our first time going through the programming. So I'm glad to hear you've gained a lot from it. I know we gained so much from you that will help us when we implement the program in Indiana. Um, so yeah, great group to work with. Um, well, thank you, Emily. I just want to, on behalf of Blandon Foundation and all of on our team, um, just in front of all everybody here today, thank you guys so much for stepping in with us and, and being willing to work with our three communities. And um, it's I really appreciated the partnership. And uh, those of us who were able to hear Roberto's keynote on the first day, he did a tremendous amount of detailed research on um, COVID impacts of and readiness in the state. So we're really grateful to you. Um, we have one, um, there is a question in the, in the chat here for the whole group, but I'm wondering, Emily, do you have any final reflections about the work or could you maybe say a word? I know I'm interested in what plans do you at Purdue have to roll this out more broadly across um, in, with partners? Um, sure, yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, um, of course, these three counties did a great job with the the curriculum. Um, we are piloting the program. We haven't implemented the program yet in any counties in Indiana, and that's where we plan to start is in Indiana. Um, we actually want to pilot with a community close to our main campus in West Lafayette, um, just because that's where Roberto and I are located, um, just for the ease of being able to conduct this ourselves. We have communities interested, um, but then of course COVID hit. So this was all pre-COVID. We had the curriculum ready and um, we've been working with them. We did adapt the curriculum so that it could be done online. And I thought it went very successfully with um, this particular conference. So that proves that it can be done online, but we know that sometimes people just don't feel comfortable with that. So even though we offered that option to some of the, the communities in Indiana, they want to wait until they can meet in person. Um, so we are exploring um, some other communities that might be open to meeting online um, to um, pilot the full program. Um, the condensed program has all of the key elements, so I don't want anyone to think you're missing out on a lot. We do go a little bit more into trust exer exercises, and then we talk about legal considerations that are specific to Indiana, um, and we have that information, but of course, um, that could differ in Minnesota. Um, but we're excited to be able to get this um, on the ground running in Indiana, and then we'll see where it goes from there if it goes national. But we do thank you for the opportunity. Hey, Allison, I'm going to give you a shout out to uh, give you a chance to put your question out to the group that you dropped in the chat. Oh, I'm loaded with questions. I realize I have to follow up because <laughs> I'll take all your time. But I do have a, I, my experience in um, our work with around the census made it very clear that at least in Itasca County, our townships are not online. Um, and when COVID struck, their normal way of communicating in person 
um, wasn't going to work. So we really lost out on uh, when it came to census. I'm just wondering if you, I'd be uh, just put it out there that anybody who's aware of um, broad work by the Township Association um, or interest among townships, I'd love to know about that. I think that's a, a really important gap that needs to be explored. And if you have any any reactions or if you agree with me, I'd love to know that too. This is, this is Barbara from Lee County. I have been out to every township in this county once or more, as well as some other folks. And I gotta tell you, their hair stands on end when you mm -hmm. bring up Zoom. We've made some progress. We have some townships that are actually adding wireless features to their building. A few are buying some equipment, but the townships as a whole, it's a very, very tough issue and really challenging because when you think about emergencies, this is a time you wanna be able to do a Zoom call. This is, and we've done that with all the city administrators in the county, but the townships are another deal altogether. We, under our, our CARES Act contract, have Shannon, who's on our group here, who are ready to go out and train people on using Zoom. Their hair stands on end when you bring up Zoom. I don't know how many people have participated in the Township Association Conference, which was totally Zoom. And it looked to me like most people were not gonna attend. So it's, the townships are a real challenge. Well, I feel confirmation anyway of what we're experiencing. Thank you. Hey, Thanks, if Barbara. I could add to that, Barbara had me go to a couple of the townships for her and I went to my own for the first time, um, which was good because they were asking me to run for supervisor and I was like, I don't know what they do. <laughs> so I wanted to see it first, but um, one of them, I don't know if he had had a bad experience with Zoom or heard bad experience, you know, but the chairman, he was so adamant against it. And, you know, I can only say it's either based off experience or, or what he's heard about it, where, you know, others are more open to it, but if they're not all open to it, it it's not, you know, gonna work. So I think it's just changing a mindset and how. I will add that, that we did, uh, our emergency services group has a really positive relationship with the townships and a different, in the county and a different relationship than we do. We have been using them to multiple message because we're also trying to get their CARES Act dollars sent into the county by November 15th. And they are so difficult to communicate with. One of them, Shannon went out and got the check personally because they didn't want to put it in the mail. So um, emergency services has been a big backbone support to us on our communications with them because it's a challenge. Relationships rule, right? That's that's a that's a great tip. Thanks, Barbara, for that. Hey, good if well, I, go, go ahead, Shannon. If I could add one more thing. Um, so the the treasurer for my local township, and she's been on our broadband committee too. So she's done Zoom um, with her internet. She has a writers group, and they had been meeting outside all summer. And so she called me to set up a Zoom meeting for her, and we tested it beforehand. Um, I had to log in and then I could turn over hosting duties to her. But in our phone conversation, she's like, well, we want to, we want to pay you for your zoom, you know, subscription. And if you could do this every month, you know, we'll pay you. And I'm like, well, I use it for other stuff, you know, and this and the VFW, you know, I was like, you're not going to pay me 15 bucks every month. <laughs> like you might as well get your own zoom subscription. So you could have unlimited, you know, time of meetings and, and so it, it just goes back to the education. And so once I did that and they saw it was going to work for their group, you know, now they're going to, one of the ladies is going to get her own Zoom subscription and stuff like that. So they can do it throughout the winter. But um, I, I think it's just talking about it and, you know, people just, they don't know what they don't know kind of thing. And, you know, I was like, I feel guilty taking your money every month for something I'm going to have, you know, whether you use it or not. So. But I, I just want to add that I had to have conversations with the same person who has been a really huge support of broadband in our community. She will not Zoom knit, but she will Zoom with the writers group. She will So people have really funny ideas about what Zoom is appropriate to be used for. No, you can't. I said, Janet, I knit with people in California on Zoom and we talk and we drink. No, you cannot Zoom and knit. You can write and Zoom, but you can't <laughs> Zoom and knit. <laughs> 
I'll tell you one of my takeaways from this conversation, and it feels like it comes back to me every year is, why are we doing this township by township? We're talking about solving it at the township level. I know we have 87 counties, how many hundreds of townships? We gotta, we gotta figure this out, but I, I so appreciate everybody being in conversation. Um, like I said at the top, I think you know conversation really is the crucible of action and nothing starts without a conversation. And so um, I'm glad we've had a chance to kind of bump into each other this morning through the open space. And I hope that it, it, people feel charged up and um, fed spiritually and intellectually by the conversation we had today. So we're, we're kind of getting close to the wrap for the morning. I wanna um, remind everybody, we are gonna be uh, hoping to see you at our reception this evening. I was talking to somebody about the reception about when it started and and I said 4.30 and they said, wow, you guys are early drinkers. <laughs> so it is BYOB, bring your own beverage, bring your own snacks. Um, hope to see you there. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Mary for um, further instructions about uh, tonight and with announcements about what's in store for us tomorrow. Well, I'm just typing or I'm just putting the link. Um, I can't type and talk at the same time. I'm just um, pasting the link to the reception in the chat box. Um, if you go ahead and click on that now and register, it'll send you an email and give you a chance to add it to your calendar. Um, but we hope to see you tonight at 4.30. We're going to have a little bit of fun, play a little bit of trivia, um, do some other fun things. Get, um, another fun thing is if, you know, if somebody has been really important to your conference experience, you can give them a shout out. Do some, um, and we'll do some shout outs to some of our A1 participants. So uh, hope And there'll be prizes, there. right? Right, oh, Mary? Yeah, yeah. We have, we have, still have a bunch of prizes to give out, some good ones. So um, be sure you stop in. Um, and then I'll, you know, I'll actually be circulating the link to the reception again this afternoon at around four when I send out the link to tomorrow's session with Tom Friedman. So watch for that. That's all I got, Bernadine. Good. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to thank again everybody for their rapt attention and participation. This one is wonderful to be together and hope to see you at the reception tonight and Tom Friedman's keynote in the morning. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you.